In the previous video of this series, you were introduced to the concept of transactions and unspent transaction outputs (UTXOs). In this video, you learn how Bitcoin transactions are made secure and how they are validated by the Bitcoin network. So, how do you go about building a system that anyone can trust, and how do you prevent someone from spending more Bitcoin than they actually own? This is where cryptography is of vital importance, specifically cryptographic hash functions and asymmetric key cryptography. Consider a scenario in which all of 20 Bitcoin is passed from Mark to Johnny, then from Johnny to Elon, and then from Elon to Richard. For the purposes of this discussion, there's no change involved. There are no fees involved either. We'll focus on Johnny's payment to Elon for now. Perhaps he's buying a new car for 20 Bitcoin. It's a nice car, by the way. Johnny asks Elon for his Bitcoin address, and Elon chooses the option in his Bitcoin wallet to create one. By the way, Elon doesn't have to worry about the technical details of what happens next, because his wallet handles all of the processing for him. Behind the scenes, Elon's Bitcoin wallet creates a pair of asymmetric encryption keys. One of them is called the private key, and the other is called the public key. Each key is actually a very, very big number. A 256-bit binary number, in fact. The biggest possible 256-bit binary number, when converted to decimal, has 77 digits. That's pretty close to the estimated number of atoms in the known universe. This means a 256-bit binary number is practically impossible to guess. The private key is created first, then this is used to derive a public key, which means that these two numbers are mathematically related to each other. You can generate the public key from the private key, but you can't generate the private key from the public key. Elon's Bitcoin wallet generates these keys using an algorithm called the Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm, ECDSA. These are called asymmetric encryption keys because if either one of them is used to encrypt some data by means of a special program, then the data can only ever be decrypted with the other key. If data are encrypted with the public key, then only the private key can be used to decrypt the data. In fact, your web browser automatically employs this principle whenever you establish secure communication with a website. Furthermore, if data are encrypted with the private key, then only the public key can be used to decrypt the data. This might strike you as rather pointless because the public key is not a secret. It's public. However, it's important to appreciate that if a person encrypts data with their private key and gives the encrypted data to someone else along with the matching public key, then someone else can verify the owner of the public key without ever seeing the private key. You're about to see how crucial this concept is when it comes to Bitcoin transactions. Back to the scenario then. Elon has a matching pair of asymmetric keys. His public key is no secret, but it's vitally important that he doesn't share his private key with anyone. And he absolutely must not lose it. He's going to need it later. Elon's Bitcoin wallet now uses his public key to generate a Bitcoin address. It does this by applying a hashing algorithm to his public key. This results in a different, very big number called a hash value. The hash value is unique to the public key that it was created from. No other public key could have been used to create it. If you were to apply the same hashing algorithm to an identical public key, you would get exactly the same hash value. But if you were to change the public key by, say, just one bit, you would get a completely different hash value. Another very important feature of a hash value is that you cannot use it to work out what the original data was. Hashing is a one-way calculation. With Bitcoin in particular, Elon's public key is actually hashed multiple times to generate his Bitcoin address. 
Firstly, it's hashed using an algorithm called SHA-256, which produces a 256-bit number. This hash value is then hashed again using a different algorithm called RIP-EMD-160, Race Integrity Primitives Evaluation Message Digest. This results in a 160-bit number. This 160-bit number is what we now refer to as the public key hash. This is what will be used to identify Elon. But generating an address doesn't stop there. An extra 8 bits are then added to the start of the public key hash to indicate the type of transaction. For a typical transaction, a so-called pay-to-public-key hash transaction, like the one Johnny is about to create, Elon's public key hash will be prefixed with eight zeros. The remaining few steps of generating a Bitcoin address are important to ensure that the address is transmitted on the Bitcoin network without corruption. The principle is to calculate another, much smaller number from the prefixed public key hash, and then to append this number to the prefixed public key hash. This number is called a checksum. When the Bitcoin address is transmitted from one computer to another, the receiving computer will perform the same calculation on the prefixed public key hash and check that the value it calculates matches the checksum. To calculate the checksum, the prefixed public key hash is hashed again with SHA-256 and then this hash value is hashed again with SHA-256. The first 32 bits of the new hash value are then appended to the public key hash. This is the checksum. We now have Elon's full Bitcoin address. It's converted into base 58 format to make it easier to read. A copy of Elon's Bitcoin address is then sent to Johnny's wallet. When Johnny's wallet receives Elon's Bitcoin address, it recalculates the checksum on the address using his public key hash. And if the recalculated checksum matches the checksum that was sent, it can assume that the address was transmitted without corruption. It then begins to construct a new transaction. This type of transaction is known as a pay to public key hash transaction, or P2PKH transaction for short. There are other types of transaction, but this type is by far the most common. It has one input, which includes the transaction number of Mark's transaction and an index number, in this case zero, to indicate the first output of Mark's transaction. We can't see it here, but Mark's transaction might have had several outputs. To put that another way, the input of Johnny's transaction refers to one of the unspent transaction outputs that he owns. The input of Johnny's transaction is effectively the 20 Bitcoin he received from Mark and has yet to spend. Johnny's transaction also has an output which specifies an amount of 20 Bitcoin and Elon's Bitcoin address. Johnny's wallet applies the SHA-256 hashing algorithm to all of the transaction data, which results in a 256-bit hash value. This hash value is then hashed again with SHA-256. The resulting double hash value is unique to this transaction. No other transaction data could have possibly resulted in the same value. This value becomes the transaction identifier, TXID, and it's included in the transaction data. It's displayed in hexadecimal format for readability. Johnny's wallet also makes use of an asymmetric pair of keys. Johnny's private key is used to encrypt the transaction ID. And this encrypted hash value is also included with the transaction data. The encrypted transaction ID is called a digital signature. It could only have originated from this particular transaction, and only Johnny's matching public key can decrypt it. As long as Johnny keeps his private key a secret, there can be no doubt that he created this transaction. Johnny's transaction is then copied across the Bitcoin network, along with his public key. Each one of tens of thousands of so-called full nodes validate the transaction before passing on a copy. 
In order for it to be successfully propagated, a transaction must satisfy a number of criteria, including that it must have at least one input and one output. It must not be smaller than 100 bytes in size, and it must not exceed the maximum possible block size. It cannot be a coin-based transaction. These are not propagated. If it refers to the output of a Coinbase transaction, there must be at least 100 blocks on top of the Coinbase transaction's block. The sum of the input values must not be less than the sum of the output values. Normally it's a little more to include a fee. Each input must refer to the output of another transaction that has not already been spent, and the creator of a transaction must own the UTXOs to which it refers. I'll say more about checking for double spending and ownership of UTXOs in a moment. Let's assume that Johnny's transaction is found to be valid. It now needs to be confirmed by adding it to a new block in the blockchain. Each full node has a data structure in its memory called the transaction pool or mempool. This is where new valid transactions await confirmation. Each full node also holds a copy of the entire blockchain on secondary storage such as a hard drive. Specialised full nodes, called mining nodes, compete with each other to create the next block. A mining node assembles a block by selecting valid transactions from the mempool. Transactions which include the highest fees are preferred. The mining node must then perform a proof-of-work calculation, which was described in a previous video. A copy of the new block is propagated to all of the other full nodes in the Bitcoin network. Each node independently validates the block before passing on a copy. If the block is found to be valid, it can be added to the blockchain. Exactly how a new block is validated and added to the blockchain is another story. Once a transaction is part of the blockchain, it's deemed to be confirmed. Confirmed transactions are then removed from the mempool. Whenever a miner succeeds in adding a new block to the blockchain, they win the block reward and the transaction fees for that block. Now, Elon is in a position to spend some Bitcoin. He wants to spend 20 Bitcoin on Richard. Lucky Richard. Elon asks Richard for a Bitcoin address. Richard's wallet creates an asymmetric pair of keys. It uses the public key to generate a Bitcoin address, and the address is sent to Elon. Richard keeps his private key a secret. He'll need it later. Elon's wallet creates a new transaction. The transaction has one input. This input includes the transaction number of Johnny's transaction and an index number of zero, indicating the first output of Johnny's transaction. Elon's transaction is attempting to spend the 20 Bitcoin he received from Johnny earlier. Elon's transaction has an output that specifies these 20 Bitcoin should go to Richard's address. Elon's transaction is then double hashed with SHA-256 to generate a transaction ID. This is then encrypted with Elon's private key to create a digital signature, and the digital signature is included in the transaction. Elon's transaction, along with his public key, is then propagated around the Bitcoin network and validated. The same checks that were applied to Johnny's transaction are now applied to Elon's transaction. Is it within the specified size limits? Is the input amount bigger than the output amount? And so on. Validation also needs to ensure that each transaction input is indeed the unspent transaction output of a previous transaction. In other words, that Elon hasn't already spent the 20 Bitcoin he got from Johnny. To enable this check, all of the full nodes in the Bitcoin network hold a copy of a database called the UTXO set. This database contains records of all the unspent transaction outputs in the Bitcoin network. It amounts to several gigabytes worth of data. When Johnny paid Elon, a UTXO was removed from the UTXO set because he was spending the 20 Bitcoin he got from Mark. But at the same time, a new UTXO was added to the set 
because he was paying those 20 Bitcoin to Elon. If the input of Elon's transaction referred to an output that was not in the UTXO set, the transaction validation would fail. Validation of a transaction must also ensure that the spender actually owns the UTXOs referred to by the inputs of their new transaction. In this case, that Elon actually owns the 20 Bitcoin Johnny paid to him earlier. To do this, a validating node duplicates Elon's public key and hashes it accordingly to generate his Bitcoin address. It then checks that the address it has just generated is the same as the address specified in the output of Johnny's transaction, which he created to pay Elon. If the addresses didn't match, the transaction would fail validation. But if they do match, the validating node then checks that Elon's digital signature was created with a private key that corresponds to the public key he used to generate his Bitcoin address, the address that Johnny said he wanted to pay. Think about it. If Elon's digital signature does indeed match the public key he used to create the address that was included in the output of Johnny's transaction, then for practical purposes there can be no doubt that it is Elon who is redeeming the 20 Bitcoin Johnny intended for him to have. Finally, once the valid transaction has made its way into a block in the blockchain, Elon's UTXO from Johnny is removed from the UTXO set and a new one for Richard is added. Elon's transaction is now confirmed and irreversible. Needless to say, when Johnny spent the 20 Bitcoin he got from Mark, the ownership of the UTXO was checked in the same way. Crucially, the digital signature on Johnny's transaction was used to verify that he owned the UTXO that Mark created for him. So you can see, if you were to receive some Bitcoin, you need a Bitcoin address, and if you want to spend it later, you must have the private key that matches the public key that was used to create that address. If you like, you can create a new address every time someone pays you, which means you will need a different private key to redeem each payment. But if you lose all of your private keys, you lose all of your Bitcoin. Now, this is not the whole picture. Different types of transactions can have different validation rules. For that reason, the instructions on how a node should validate a transaction are actually stored within the transaction. They are part of the transaction data. These instructions are written in a very simple programming language called script. But that's another story.